This talk is entitled Introduction and Examples, and it's the last talk. So, uh, but that came because uh, of some changes in schedule. And I'm sorry that I couldn't attend everyone's talk. Uh, this workshop hits most of my teaching spots, but I hope this can still be useful and entertaining. So, and please do feel free to ask any questions in between, either uh, verbally or via the chat. Maybe the organizers can help there as well. So, yeah, what is this about? So I want to make three main points. Uh, one, so there, there are, of course, many different ways how machine learning can potentially contribute to science. And I want to, and, and also the technologies that come with it. We heard one talk about automatic differentiation for density functional theory, for example, right? And here I want to focus on one particular way of um, trying to contribute and that is surrogate modeling i'll come back to what that is basically replacing an expensive to evaluate function with a machine learning model that is not expensive to evaluate and second we, we will do this for um, potential so we will try to learn the potential energy function of a system and through this um, hopefully enable simulations dynamic simulations of uh, larger systems, so perhaps a few thousand atoms instead of a few hundred, uh, longer simulations, maybe nanoseconds or longer, and also more simulations simply. So basically get more bang out of the invested compute buck. And then finally, the third point I would like to make is that one key to achieving this will be the integration of domain knowledge into the machine learning model for increased data efficiency. So needing less training data and less reference data. And we saw an example for that as well in Kieran Burke's talk yesterday, um, where he used the Konsham equations to regularize a machine learning model. So this is the focus of the talk that I would like to present today. We have worked in other areas as well, but well, I have to make some, some selections, right? Some choices. Okay, the, the presentation has two parts. The one is the introductory part where I would like to talk about the principles underlying these machine learning potentials. And then I would like to briefly show two studies currently ongoing in my group. One is about calculating thermal transport coefficients using the green Kubo formalism. And the other is the attempt to construct the fastest possible machine learning potential in some sense, of course. Um, yeah, so these are the two parts. Um, so let's start, oh, yeah, oh, right, right. And I should mention here still that unfortunately I couldn't uh, attend Christoph Schutt's talk, but we are using one of his models here. So another connection to this workshop. Uh, so what's machine learning? You already heard a lot, so I'll be brief here, but I would like maybe to point out uh, for the, what I need for my later parts in my talk. So um, it's about machine algorithms whose performance in, measured in some way, loss functions, right? We saw that improves with the amount of data or the quality of data or whatever with data uh, that is available. That's the learning part, right? That this definition captures. That's due to Tom Mitchell in his book. And there are other definitions, for example, one by a pioneer of machine learning from 1959, which also tells you that this um, field is maybe a bit older than one would think when one enters it is that machine learning is about solving problems without providing explicit task specific solutions. So like find the shortest path in a graph, but it will not program explicitly an algorithm that finds the shortest path. I'll just say here are a few examples of shortest paths. Please generalize in some way and give me shortest paths in new graphs that you haven't seen, right? That's the idea. Um, again, I want to be brief here, but the, at least the way we are using machine learning is, is a lot about interpolation in high dimensional spaces, by which I mean finding a model, a function that goes through a prescribed set of points in a high dimensional space. For example, the space spanned by all the atomic coordinates and real space coordinates and element types of a number of atoms, for example. Mostly used for prediction and analysis. So also an interesting part, the analysis part. 
Uh, and in general, it's about systematic identification of regularity in data, right? Of patterns, if you want. And that means it has a lot of connections to other fields like mathematics, for example. Think about compression, right? If you can find a pattern in data, you can compress the data, right? Because you can just write down fewer data and the law, and that's it. So there's a tight connection there, for example. There are many connections like that. Statistical mechanics, I, that's an, it's all, these connections are their own topic, basically. Um, nicely enough, I just mentioned this here, I don't address it in any way, but there is a theory of machine learning as well, and that can be, can be very, very instructive, and there are nice connections to physics also. Okay, enough of the general. So, <laughs> I'm not sure if, if anyone has shown this already, then please just tell me and I'll go on. But if not, I feel it is important when discussing a new method to also discuss the shortcomings and problems of the methods, right? It's, it's uh, if you just have the advertisement talk, that's not worth too much, right? For example, if you see a new method published in a fancy computer science conference uh, in machine learning, and you think, oh, this might be great for my problem. And then you, you take the code, you change it, you apply it. And after three months, you realize, ah, yeah, but the method doesn't work for that kind of data. That's not nice, right? But if the people who wrote the article do discuss the limitations of their approach, then maybe you save three months, right? And can choose another one. Okay, long enough uh, general um, comments. This here, what I want to, I want to show a little bit of this here. So this photo is from an image database. The machine learning task was to identify the content of the photographs, for example, here a Horus. And uh, there was a neural network that performed pretty well. And then researchers, um, to try to interpret the model, right? Like uh, derive, find out which features make it recognize horses. Is it the color, the shape? Is it a combination of these things? Whatever it is. And then they realized when they looked at their results that um, most of the horse images in that database had the same copyright notice in the image. So all the neural network learned was the copyright notice. So that is an important lesson, right? Uh, because it tells us if you if you tell a, an algorithm a machine to do something, but just based on examples, and you don't tell it exactly how to do it, you are in for surprises. And the same holds for the physics and chemics, chemistry uh, and materials um, uh, applications as well. So I think it's uh, analysis is important. Here's another example of the same thing that shows highlights another limitation or property, if you want. Um, so there are neural networks, you give them an image and the neural network gives you a sentence describing the image. For example, you show it an image of green rolling hills with sheep on it, and it tells you green rolling hills with sheep grazing. And that's great. And it, it can be really, really amazing, um, the, the, the good positive examples. However, if you slightly tweak your images and give it this, for example, then two of the good ones at the time said a flock of birds flying in the air and the other said a group of giraffe standing next to a tree, both of which are pretty far from this image, right? So why, why did this happen? Well, because this image is unlike any image the, neuro, the, the underlying algorithms uh, had seen in their data, right? This image is not covered by the reference data. The same thing holds for us here. We will talk about machine learning potentials. If you encounter configurations of a system that are not covered by your training data, well, you will have a, a, a hole in your potential energy surface or at least some error and probably your MD will explode because the energy uh, grows unlimited. So um, this is a limitation that one should be aware of, right? And a good part of uh, building uh, working machine learning models is thinking about which data to give them, right? And since our data will be expensive because we need electronic structure methods to generate it, we want to be very efficient and provide it as little data as possible to learn a potential energy surface. Okay, so much for that. Um, I, I mean, if I show a negative example, I should also show a positive example, right? And then I will switch soon to the actual physics and chemistry part. Uh, I just want to point out that there's such a wide range of applications these days. And I will not go through them because we are focused on the more physics and chemistry parts, um, but, but just look at the list, right? Probably you know many of them already, right? Um, brain, yeah, reading brain waves to find out what the person is thinking, processing natural language, generating it, parsing it, recommending things, uh, you know, robots, cars, everything. Um, and that's just such a tiny selection. Now, I'll show one example that works <laughs> from art. So here's a photograph. 
And there's something called style transfer and uh, you can transfer the style from one image to another. So for example, this is this famous Japanese picture, I think with a wave and you would transfer the style to the photograph, you get this. Or starry night sky by Van Gogh, I think. Uh, you transfer the style, you get this. Now, if you, I mean, it, it looks good, I think. If you look closely, you wonder, okay, would he, re I mean, is this really the same style? Probably not quite, right? But I think it's a pretty impressive result already. So just to show one, one non science example that works, and now we are good and can go to the scientific applications here. Um, again, in the last years, so much new things, so many new things, right? It's used, I mean, it has been used for quite some while in particle physics, in astronomy, simulation of galaxies, many body problems, right? In mathematics, solving partial differential equation, in mechanics, fluid problems, bioinformatics, network analysis, neurosciences, so many. We will focus on the middle row, physics, chemistry, material science, and perhaps connections to pharmaceutical sciences. And here in this talk, just learning potential energy surfaces. So um, I'll show the re results for specific ones, but so what is this problem and, 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 and how do we address it? What are these surrogate models? Uh, maybe let me skip one slide ahead. Okay, no, let, okay, let, let's take this order then of the slides. So I would like to make a few, discuss a few aspects before. So here we have been focusing a lot on computational data and that is what I will talk about today. But of course, these approaches have long been used for experimental data, right? In chemical informatics, for example. And it's perhaps instructive to think a bit about the differences and commonalities between experimental data, learning experimentally measured properties and computational properties. So for example, a decisive, decisive and uh, crucial aspect of machine learning potential is how do we represent an input to the machine learning model, right? Which features do we use? And if we think about features for experimentally described compounds, let's say, um, or computationally uh, modeled ones. So in the experimental case, we will almost always have incomplete information. Why? Well, sometimes we have only partial information in the sense of we know the covalent bonding, but we don't know exact coordinates, for example. And indeed, probably not a single set of coordinates is enough to accurately predict a property. Uh, you don't, you never know what's in the sample, right? If the experiment is not conducted very carefully, then there might be impurities like in alloys, right? You might like inadvertently dope the alloy and then that can change your properties, right? So we have incomplete information in multiple senses and usually strong measurement noise. That differs a lot, of course, you can do very accurate experiments, obviously, um, but if you have like a biological cell assay, you can easily have like two, three orders of magnitude of noise. That's a lot. Now, on the other hand, for the computational data we are dealing with here and today in this talk, we have complete information by definition, because if we learn computational data, there was a computational, let's say an electronic structure calculation and the input by definition describes the, 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 the model system, the molecule or material, uh, enough so that we can run the simulation. So we means we have by definition, all the information that we need to learn, which is nice. And there is basically no noise, right? There is in principle, some maybe they have convergence limits and some last bits might be off, but, but I mean, there's no real noise. So these are the diff these are two differences, but there are also commonalities, right? It, in both cases, experiments are usually expensive, right? The actual wet lab experiments, you need reagents, the laboratory, the people, computational, you need big computers often, right? You need the people, it's, it's a lot of money or energy invested. Um, and that is why we usually want to get away with small training sets, right? Just you, I mean, enough, you have to have enough data to build a model, but we want to make this as data efficient as possible. Huh. And then other commonalities are often we have large input spaces, for example. Uh, maybe you want to screen a database of all possible molecules up to 20 non-hydrogen atoms. That has been generated, but that's really huge, or 17, I think, up to 17. Um, so, or if you want to learn a potential energy surface of a molecule with n degrees, uh, with n atoms, then you have, let's say, um, theoretically, uh, n minus um, 
uh, 3n minus uh, six degrees of freedom if you take out translation and rotation. Uh, that's a very high dimensional space, right? And one should ask the question, why can we even learn this in the first place? Um, and the answer is, in short, because of the correlations in the data. Um, and the, and the rest, as a, in, that the, the data doesn't exploit the whole space. And there is, yeah, and there is often covariate shift. So covariate shift means that uh, the, the distribution that generated your training data, your reference data, and the distribution the, of the new samples that you apply your model to are often different, a little bit different, a lot different. And this is, this, I mean, in principle, this wouldn't be necessary if you perfectly build your models, but in practice, it's always there to some extent. Uh, and then the question is, how do you deal with that? Okay, that was just an excursion into experimental versus computational data. Um, so these, uh, the, I mentioned already that I will focus on the mach on machine learning potentials today. What, what do we do with them? Why, why would we want them in the first place? Well, I already mentioned um, that we can run longer simulations of larger systems, and I will indeed focus on that today with the example studies from a group. Um, but also, um, we might be interested in highly accurate and precise property predictions, and indeed, uh, either directly that would be more chemotraumatic style or via simulations. And I will show examples for that too, thermal transport coefficients, for example. And for regarding the accuracy, indeed, we have just now started to build models um, where the underlying reference data comes from quantum Monte Carlo calculations, so highly accurate, but very expensive calculations. Uh, and finally, but certainly not lastly, the, the exploration of large design spaces. So I didn't mention, but uh, I was in industry for a while um, before I, I switched to Constance University. And there, for example, we focused on optimizing materials, finding new materials. And well, these are really, really large spaces, right? Uh, it's what, I mean, people often work with these molecular data sets, the QM9, for example, uh, where a systematic enumeration of certain molecules. Uh, but you also, if you do the same for materials and maybe very alloy composition, you quickly run into huge spaces. And you, we want to screen these spaces somehow, explore them, but using only very few reference data, which is challenging. Okay, here are some now very physics, chemistry, and materials oriented uh, possibilities how to apply these models. Now let's discuss briefly how they work. You already saw <laughs> the, the introduction at the end, or so you already saw examples, so I will be maybe brief here, right? I want to point out for later that we have the hierarchy, uh, a, a hierarchy, um, it, it don't take this seri too seriously, of different approximations to actual solutions uh, to Schrodinger's or Dirac's equation. For example, we have full configuration interaction methods, which give us numerically accurate solutions but are exponentially slow. And then we have all the like couple cluster, CCSDT, maybe as a gold standard in chem chemistry, we have uh, constant density functional theory that was discussed a lot already. And that's the current Verkos method, if you want, up all the way down to like purely mechanical force fields, no explicit quantum effects, but very, very fast. And I'll come back to that at the end. All right, and the cost increases upwards, uh, sorry, the cost in, yeah, increases upwards and also the accuracy. Now, this is unavoidable in principle, right? I think it is known that, for example, the true functional uh, in DFT is NP hard to compute, um, if I remember that right. And that means there will most likely be no simple trick to make this fast, right? And maybe that, it, this seems like plausible, right? It's a many, many body problems are hard in principle and well, you have to do some work if you want to get accurate solutions. But in certain settings, when we do a lot of these calculations like in a dynamic simulation where we have many evaluations of energies and forces, then you can use machine learning, right? And that's the idea of machine learning potentials. Now, and now we are at the point where I can come back to the term a surrogate model. Um, here specifically surrogate models for potential energy surfaces. And I guess you have heard this already in Christoph's talk, but uh, let me be brief here. This is a general idea, right? We have some input space. This can be configuration space, coordinates of uh, the atoms of a molecule, for example, or periodic boundary conditions for materials. It can be something else altogether. We have some output space. Here it's the energy, so a scalar function, but we could also be interested in tensor value functions, for example. Um, 
or maybe polarizability, I think was mentioned. So, and then we have a, a, a functional relationship, the black line. This is our reference, our ground truth. It could be EFT, it could be Quantum Monte Carlo, it could be FCI. Um, we can't compute the black line for every input space. Also, this input space is not linear, right? It's just a symbolic picture, a sketch. The input space is usually quite high dimensional. And we cannot compute the black function for all the input points. It's just too expensive. But what we can do is we can calculate some at some points. These are the red points. These are our reference data. And then we can fit a function, right? The blue dashed line, the machine learning model. And that function, if we do it well, will behave similarly <laughs> um, to, the, to the function that we want to learn to the electronic structure calculation. So that's the idea. The general idea is create a machine learning surrogate for something expensive here specifically for potential energy surfaces. There, I mean, if you think about this, there, you can, even from this picture, you can already learn a lot in the sense of uh, this can only work this idea if there are correlations in this input space, right? If this is some random function, then there's nothing to learn. There must be a pattern here, right? Um, so we are interested in learning, and yeah, right. If you have a finite number of points and you learn something as in quotation marks, infinite dimensional, like a function, well, there's no unique solution. That's an ill posed problem, by the, right? So all we can, we, we have to have an additional criterion, at least one. And usually in machine learning, that's a find the smoothest function in some sense that goes through these points. And you have to select somehow, right? Every function that goes through these points are infinitely many, which one do you choose? And if you're ch choosing the smoothest function in some sense goes well with physics in this case, because if you look at, for example, let's say you learn not immediately the electronic structure calculation of your choice, but you learn the Delta from a cheaper method to a more expensive method. Usually people report that the higher level of theory you have, the smoother these differences will be. So probably not great to learn from a purely mechanical force field to something uh, expensive, but maybe you can learn from a semi-empirical method to a higher rung of DFT, for example. Right? And this, is, this, uh, and this uh, observation that these differences are often smooth goes very well with the machine learning. And yeah, there's more, of course, to tell, but let's let's uh, be uh, somewhat brief here today. Um, yeah, right. How do you define this space, for example? Right. Which features do you use? How do you describe your atomistic system? Um, and so I I said in the beginning that I would emphasize that we can do surrogate models here for the potential energy surface, and what we would do with them: um, fast simulations, long simulations, uh, so large system simulations. And then I stress data efficiency. And I've mentioned it a few times. And I will, this is the last time now. I want to show with this toy example why data efficiency is so important. So here the task is to learn a simple 2D function, a checkerboard function, right? Just squares. Now on the left hand side, what you see is a plain off the shelf, uh, plain vanilla machine learning algorithm, a Gaussian process in this case with a Gaussian kernel. Uh, which learns, tries to learn this 2D checkerboard function. No domain knowledge in the sense of it doesn't know anything about the function. Now, if you have 50 samples, there's nothing to see. Even as a human, you couldn't see anything yet. And yeah, you have something here, 500, 10 times more. Okay, as a human, maybe you could figure it out and the result, the predictions look reasonable, let's say. And then with again, 10 times more, well, so two orders of magnitude more than in the beginning, 5,000 points, okay, sure, the pattern is there because we really covered the space. And here we have a reasonable checkerboard, but still not great. Okay, now the only difference on the right-hand side is that now I tell the algorithm, specifically the kernel, that it's learning a periodic function in the horizontal and vertical direction. So I give it some domain knowledge, right? This domain knowledge later for the potential energy surfaces will be like probably Christoph said, uh, architecture of the neural network, the special design of the features that we use to describe uh, atomistic systems and these things, right? Or in the DFT, perhaps uh, asymptotic limits that we know, right? Domain knowledge. Here it's just, I'm learning a periodic function. 50 examples, we don't see much, but the result is already almost as good as here. 500, we're done. And the result is, well, arguably maybe better than here, or at least the same. One order of magnitude less data one order of magnitude, less reference calculations, right? And perhaps, yes. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, so this, this toy example is just meant to show that it's really, when you do this machine learning models, uh, it's really, especially if you, if you work with high level methods, it's really worth thinking about how you can make them data efficient. All right, um, let's have a look at two examples from my group. Um, so here's the first project. This is about uh, thermal conductivities of materials via message bus neural networks and using the green Kubo formalism. This is joint work with the Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin, Matthias Schaeffler, Christian Carbonio, Florian Knob. He has now changed, I think, for his postdoc and Marcel Langer, who is there among other places and students uh, from my group. So what's this about? Um, I, since I was told that people in this audience are already familiar with physics and chemistry, I will not address this a lot. There is this green Kubo formalism. Uh, let us, in case you're uh, forgot, um, let's take a quick look at this formula. We are interested in calculating the thermal transport coefficient kappa here. So uh, how well a material transports heat. We are simplifying, we just calculate uh, a, a coefficient, not a tensor, so not, a, yeah. Um, yeah, but we are interested in an overall characterization of how well the material transports heat as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, it's of, no, sorry. Well, okay, let's ignore that. Um, and this quantity is proportional to this expression here. And what I want to point out is that um, what we need to do here intuitively to calculate this is we will be running a dynamic simulation. It needs to be long for as a true to converge, right? And it also needs to have a reasonably large uh, supercell so that we can observe uh, a, a sufficient um, phonons and vibrations to, to determine the, the thermal transport coefficients from the data. Um, yeah, excuse me uh, if, I, if I'm not, uh, yeah. I, I think I would like to keep it at this. And um, yeah, the idea is that we will, you can do this brute force. And indeed our current study is based on a prior work by uh, Christian Carbonio uh, from the FHI where they investigated zirconia, so zirconium dioxide uh, using pure ab initio calculations. So let's take a look at that. Um, so this is the only schematic results slide I will have here. This is still ongoing. Um, we are almost done writing up, but it will still take a few weeks. Um, so what we see here is simulation time on the horizontal axis up to a nano nanosecond. And we have the estimated thermal transport coefficient kappa on the vertical axis. And um, the pure up initial calculation back then um, were as at the density function theory level was uh, is the black line that used about a hundred atoms and they could afford about 0.069 seconds. So that is what they could do at the time. And you see now, and the other lines here is we build a machine learning potential using the Schnett network that I assume Christoph has introduced. Um, we are now also investigating the newer architectures like Payne, um, for example, um, or Nequip. And anyway, we built a machine learning surrogate model for the potential energy surface and then run the dynamics using that surrogate model, that machine learning potential. Same number of atoms and larger systems and for much longer. And we can see that in terms of simulation length, we are converged at about half a nanosecond. And in terms of system size, we are converged at about, uh, let's say a, a thousand atoms roughly. So back then the pure up initial result was co neither converged in simulation length, nor was it conversion system size. And what they had to do back then was to do some manual trickery to get the right results out of the data that they had. Um, right, but now uh, we can do this like without the human intervention and just running the simulation, which is good in a situation where we want to do this often. For example, the next step would be that we will try to screen large databases of materials for thermal transport properties. And you can only do this if you can, well, if you can computationally afford it, right? And with a, this approach, you can. So that is the one study that I wanted to quickly outline. Um, we have, yeah, yeah. Okay. other groups are active in this area as well. I think I haven't mentioned that here or only, I will go back one slide. Yeah, no. no, there are some other groups active in this area as well. I just would like to mention that. And then the other example I want to show is another study. Um, this is with Richard Hennig 
and his back, also his uh, recently graduated student, Stephen C, who is now at NASA, and a student from my group. This is, and this study is about something we would like to call in a somewhat advertisement way, ultra fast potentials. I will rationalize why, why we do this. Okay, maybe we can start with the rationalization. What motivated us here was, uh, and thank, yeah, I would like, oh, this wasn't on the slide. I would like to give a big uh, thank you at this point to the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, IPAM. Um, some of you might know it. it. They organize interdisciplinary research, three month research programs. And it was in one of these where they bring together researchers in one discipline of math, at least with other researchers. And this was about physics. And it was at that time, about a year ago, uh, or, two, one or two maybe, um, that we came up with the idea and then and carried through. So thanks to IPAM. Um, the idea here was that we, we want to be, we said, okay, instead of playing around more with different types of machine learning models, we would like to find out um, if we can, how, also, how fast a machine learning potential can possibly be. So can we construct the fastest possible machine learning potential in some sense, uh, referring to the approach more than the implementation at this point. So, um, and then we said, okay, let's, try, let's look which concepts are there and combine the ones that seem most suitable for this. And uh, the, the, the underlying motivation you saw already, right? We want to be able to run a large number of large system long simulations. Okay, so we use, we use the usual trick, which uh, should have been introduced by now, of uh, local, as we, we don't predict the energy of the a whole system at once, of all molecule at once or a material, a unit cell, but we predict atomic contributions to the energy. Of course, the energy is not um, a, 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 a linear thing, but it turns out the approximation is good enough to get quite accurate. And this allows one to scale, right? If you predict only atomic contributions, you scale linearly in the system size and the number of atoms, and you can do basically as large as you want. Um, okay, standard trick, we used it. For the form of the potential, we didn't want, uh, so maybe I should, here I can spend a bit of time maybe. So if you look at the methods in the literature at the moment, you see three big classes. There are more, but three big ones. One is uh, neural networks or deep neural networks. The other is kernel-based methods, and the third is linear regression models. And if you if you think about speed, well, nothing beats a linear model. That's a, as a right. Um, so and uh, so we chose a linear regression model here. And a natural way to proceed with that is to learn effective many-body contributions. So we are saying our model is the usual expansion of the energy in terms of k body contributions. In practice, we have one body contributions just purely from the atoms element type, two body contributions based on distance and three body contributions based on three atoms, so angular information. We will go to four body probably, but we haven't done that yet. So this is well known, right? This is well known from force fields, for example. What we do is we learn these potentials. The difference to a force field is that we will, we have a flexible way of writing them down. I'll come to that, the spines. And uh, we just learn the form of the one, two, three body from the data. It, it's important to realize that this is not an, it's an effective many body, many body expansion. So if you would do the actual many body expansion, so, so your, your, for example, your two body term is based purely on two body data uh, that converges, but too slowly for us. You would, go have, you would have to go to higher order terms and that's not affordable, but this is effective. Right, our low dimensional terms try to mimic the actual many body problem as closely as they can. And there will be situations where they won't be able to, but so far we, we as a, so far it works well, let's say, for, for, for what we have tested, I'll come back to that. Okay, then how do we learn the two and three body terms? Um, well, we use splines. Splines are an established old technique uh, it's a um, of a modeling functions um, uh, using low order polynomials. Here we use cubic order polynomials. Why is this a good idea for speed? Well, because when you, it's, uh, let me skip one slide ahead. No, I don't. Okay, fine. Uh, look here in this image. You have individual, the third or as a uh, low order polynomials. If you would add them up, they would give some function, right? That's how we fit. And if you evaluate the resulting function at one point on the x-axis here, you have to evaluate at most, I think, four of these um, 
low dimensional polynomials. So you have constant evaluation time. And unlike in neural networks, the constant, the, the prefactor is very, very small. So this is, as far as I know, um, a, yeah, also, okay, let, let me finish. And uh, last but not least, we use some, borrow some techniques for machine learning in the current literature, for example, to regularize the resulting potential means controlling the, its smoothness. We regularize second order derivative. And yeah, you can read the preprint if you want to know why. Um, okay, and unlike manually fitted potentials, this is a fully automatic process. You have to have the data, but then it's just start the fitting function and that's it. It doesn't even take long. Okay, with these ingredients, <laughs> we build our ultra fast potentials. And let me call them this because I, I, I mean, maybe that's a faster way, but that's the fastest we could think of, let's say, without going to drastic changes like coarse graining, for example. Sure, that, that would be faster. Um, but if you want to stay all atom, this looks promising, let's say. And the results so far, I would like to show, um, I'm a, yeah. I would like to show on the left hand side uh, uh, the speed and accuracy and on the right hand side this is just to show that uh, that it works in principle here is um, uh, uh, sorry this is data for tungsten just uh, element also just tungsten just elemental tungsten but uh, uh, with a variety of configurations so defects and surfaces and whatnot huh? um, and these spectra are just, this is the underlying DFT, two body fits it okay, three body fits it fine. And we have in the preprint a lot of other data like elastic constants, we calculate melting points. Um, so we have more results there. I would say it looks pretty promising, but it's only tons. So we are, we are at the moment, we're concentrating on getting more experience with different materials. Um, oh, I, oh, okay. Um, so, and then on the left-hand side, there uh, you see a comparison with other machine learning potentials. So on the horizontal axis, there's computational cost, milliseconds per atom per step on the same hardware for all of them. Um, this is uh, on the right-hand side is the DFT reference that we fitted to. Here in the middle, we oh, so sorry, and on the vertical axis is some form of error. It measures the energy error and the force error on so a combination of both, and we have here in the middle, what I would call the sum of the current gold standard machine learning potentials, not all are there. For example, Schnett is not here yet, but GAP is there, for example, um, from Gawachani's group. And here we have some classic potentials refitted to this data set and an embedded atom model not refitted to the data set at the moment because we tried, but it was too much, it was too tedious simply. And maybe the author of that can, can do it for us, but let's see. <laughs> um, but this is the only one not refitted to the data because it was too tedious, right? Um, and that's also a point we would like to make. And now, if you look at this, we are well beyond the Pareto frontier here. And the ultra fast potential two body terms um, is as good as the fastest empirical potentials and the two and three body one also looks quite, quite promising, I think. Uh, yeah, so we are happy with these results for now and would like to go further in this direction get more experience with more systems, extend the method a bit. We are, for example, porting it also to an automatic differentiation framework, just in the previous talk. We use Google JAX, but Julia certainly is a contender. Um, yeah, so that's a few directions we are, we are going with this. And with that, I would, oh yeah, an Outlook. Um, <laughs> sorry, and then, I, and, and then I think I'm a bit over time already. So um, one, one project we have just started on is building these models for uh, quantum Monte Carlo calculations in the context of a European Center of Excellence. Um, let's see, <laughs> I'm, 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 so there are some uh, early works in this direction, building on Kappa cluster, uh, for example, as a reference as a single double petroplus triples, for example, and some Monte Carlo, but very few so far. Monte Carlo is nice because we have, uh, it's a stochastic method. We have, uh, we have some measure of uncertainties, which I want like to directly use in our models. We would like to apply the UFBs, the ultra fast potentials. I already talked about this and yeah, maybe eventually, certainly not for me in the near future, but I think if we can do these really large simulations, perhaps we can do interesting things with them. 
like, for example, calculating via simulation solubilities and maybe even PKA values for molecules, for example, for which there are no synthesized structural analogs. And that is something you can't do with chemical informatics approaches. Uh, but this is more like the long term, um, what could be. OK, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if there are. OK, thank you very much, Matthias. There's also a comment in the chat, but I think it's not in any I think language this is, that I speak. No, no, yeah, this is unrelated. That's OK. Uh, so are there any? Oh, first of all, we have a question um, from Lorenzo. Yes, you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, many thanks for the uh, very nice talk. When you mentioned at the very beginning the um, drawbacks, I still do the, the <laughs> devil's advocate. The drawbacks and, and the limitations one should be aware of. Uh, is there any way uh, to, mm, not, to know in advance what will be some kind of limitation or at least to... to, to to imagine in advance what would be the limitations induced by the, the data set in this case? Yeah, uh, well, in principle, yes, but not necessarily easily. Uh, for example, um, okay, you mentioned a kernel. Let's take the Gaussian kernel. The Gaussian kernel is, um, is uh, okay, I don't want to explain it for a long time, but let's say it's a function that depends on input space distance and your feature space. And then you, you will, you will um, close by points or configurations in that case uh, are, are similar and they would go be projected into similar dimensions. And if they're far apart, they would be projected into orthogonal dimensions. If you think that through, you will realize it's kind of a universal local function approximator. And that means you can learn basically almost anything well, but um, you need data everywhere. So maybe also not so good, right? This is probably too short to follow if, if, if it's new, but uh, if you, if you, because you mentioned kernels, I wanted to mention this as an example. And then regarding the data, yeah, for sure. But the problem is that, I mean, these data, if, if, okay, let's say the data are uh, configurations of molecules and materials um, or whatever clusters, and um, they are, the raw input data is just the coordinates and the element types of the atoms. This is already a high dimensional space and it's already here, it's hard to visualize, right? If it's a large system. You, let's say we have data from a dynamic simulation. Now every hundred steps we take a snapshot. That's our training data. Okay, but I mean, you can't look at that, right? You can look maybe at the simulation itself as a human and that, that might work well or not. But, but uh, then what, what does that tell you, right? What you want to know is when you later want to run the, Okay, I think I have to go one more step. So let's say we have a very simple machine learning potential and we don't retrain it in any way. We just train it once and then we deploy it, which is not what we should do. But let's say we do this as the simplest thing. Then what you need is that your training data cover the whole uh, space that your simulation explores. Yeah? And it needs to do that in advance, basically. Because if it doesn't, your, your simulation, your machine learning potential, if your simulation runs into a part of phase space where you don't have data, it might not work at all, or it might work less well, right? It might have higher errors. Your MD might actually go completely haywire, or you might get, just get skewed result, right? So uh, yes, in, this inf so yes, the information is somehow in the data, but can you easily, uh, find out beforehand? No, <laughs> or at well, least I don't know. How. Well, uh, but maybe it's because uh, this is one part of the problem. Another part of the problem, I would, uh, um, I would say like this, take your horse business, okay? There was a, a, a correlation inside data uh, that it was actually spurious, a correlation yes. that you don't want exactly. your yes. data to have. And since in, in artificial intelligence is about correlation, can you use in, artificial intelligence to tell you if there are correlations, what are these correlations, throw out the correlations you don't want, and then at that point use this filtered uh, data set yes. as a true data set? Also, there are some things to be said, said about this, right? In the setting that we discussed right now, I think there's nothing like a spurious correlation, right? Because mm. this is actual atoms and they're dense, right? 
it's uh, there's nothing artificial there and uh, by yes but I mean you know what I mean right um, however in other data like in the image data this might be the, in some sense this might be the case for example now with COVID people try to help and build machine learning models that predict uh, how severe the uh, course of the illness will be from an x-ray I think However, some x-rays in practice are taken when the patient is standing. Some x-rays are taken when the patient is lying on a bed, especially if he, if he is ill already, right? So a spurious correlation is from the position of the patient, there's, there's a correlation to the severity of the course that the illness will take, but it's not the correlation you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. But that would be, I think, in your sense, a spurious correlation. I'm not working in that field and I really, I really can't tell in a very well-founded way. Um, there is work, for example, on causality, but I think causality doesn't apply uh, to what we are doing here. Um, but there is work on that. It's certainly an interesting topic. And, and you could look for that direction, for example. There's okay. maybe something to be learned about uh, okay. spurious correlations. Thank and I'm you. sure there's much better answers than what I, I can give on this. Yeah, so, sorry about uh, that. It's enough for me since I, I'm not working on this field. So uh, okay. <laughs> many thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah. Do we have any questions here? Yeah, sure. And um, so I was wondering, and before we heard from uh, Christoph, for example, about the uh, now equivariant force fields and there are also the other um, SE3 um, equivariant um, force fields. And I was wondering how is the representation ability um, from these force fields from many body expansions, how it um, compares. So for example, uh, can these force fields um, differentiate um, these cases um, that Christoph described? I don't know if you saw that. And when you have, um, let's say, a third atom in the same distance, but a different angle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. Um, so, okay, that, that is, I didn't see Christoph's talk, but I'm familiar with his work. So I think uh, hopefully I can say something meaningful. Um, that's a good question. Now, that, I think there are different questions here, um, or different directions at least. So one question is, uh, can, what about, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of your question is related to the question, um, can, can, given a certain set of features on neural network architecture, can we, can we distinguish between all the possible inputs, like all the possible atomic configurations up to the symmetries that we don't want to distinguish? Exactly. That we don't want to yeah. Distinguish. yeah, right, good. So, and the answer is uh, in principle, this, as a, mm, there's very nice literature on this by Gabor Chani and surrounding um, groups. So, or uh, related groups, I should maybe better say, um, where they investigate this question uh, for their own feature set, uh, SOAP, smooth, uh, smooth overlap of atomic positions. And they show that indeed, uh, ah, yeah, and I should, yeah, and these representations, these feature sets usually have some parameters. Like for example, think of spherical harmonics expansion. How far do you take the expansion? For example, yeah, yeah. Right? right. So in the limit, you can, yeah. maybe, <laughs> if it's a good one. But they, they show that, um, Oh no, wait, wait, I, I think I, it's even worse, I think. But anyway, for an ideal representation, we would, uh, we would uh, require that it's hopefully able to distinguish at least in some limit between all possible configurations. I think for SOAP, they show that this is not possible and they have some interesting applications. So they show specific examples. Um, now, I, the thing is, I would like to discuss this, but it would take at least 10 minutes. Uh, so um, read the article. It's like, it's a bit technical in, in places. For example, even if you kind of distinguish all the uh, configurations uh, in CH4 from the point of the C atom, uh, in practice, you will also describe the hydrogen atoms and that will resolve that problem again. Yeah. Uh, yeah right, so these aspects. But uh, they, show, they show some configure, as I say, show examples that cannot be distinguished by their specific choice of features. And they show even that if these examples exist, even if they're not in your data set, they will distort the space in which you describe your systems and that will have an effect on the performance of your model, which I thought was quite interesting. So there's literature there. That's, that's the best I can say right now. <clears throat> and then you, I think your question had another aspect, um, maybe related to the networks. I'm not sure. Can, can you tell me? Yeah, I, don't, um, I, don't, I don't know, but I had the second question that kind of builds on this mm -hmm. or it's maybe related. Yeah. This you had um, two and three body expansions, um, right? 
And did you see systematic improvements then? Did you um, also try, um, let's say, more body? So oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, 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 yes. Um, we do. I mean, it's simply you, you can think about it. I mean, from a physics point, it's probably maybe not surprising, but you can think about it also from the machine learning point of view in the sense that um, if you have only two body terms and then we have two and three body terms that we learn, we have a lot more parameters because we need to learn the three body terms. So that means our model is more complex. We have more flexibility and we can thus fit more complicated functions, right? That's, that's, that's pretty straightforward, actually. And um, so, yes, uh, if the underlying data, the system requires it, uh, we, we will increase the complexity of the model by adding, for example, free body terms. And there might be systems, which may be for organic systems, that depend on four body terms as well. And uh, we, 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 will, we will do this, but it hasn't happened yet. Now. But yeah, we, we do see performance differences, not for all systems, right? If your system, an, an extreme example of not of a real system would be, let's say you have a model system with a Leonard Jones potential. By construction, our two body version will learn this exactly. So there will be zero error once you put in enough data. Um, right, because the data was generated by a two body potential basically. Um, and then if your real system is close to that, sure, we don't need anything else. And if your real system is more complicated or the phenomenon that you simulate is more complicated, you will need three, maybe three body, maybe four body, maybe even more, right? We haven't encountered them yet because this is new, but uh, we are looking for kind to, to better understand the limitations of our approach and say, okay, which system can we not model and why, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think this, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that answers most of my question. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Also? Uh, yeah, there is one more question okay. um, from mm -hmm. Zoom. We have uh, Lorenzo again. Let's go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, it should be quick. Um, when you showed your larger system, longer time example, uh, there were two systems with the same size, the DFT and the Schnett uh, around the 100 atoms. Um, I was naively expecting to to see them more, more or less superposed. Why they're oh, not? Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and I might not be able to answer it right now. Um, let me look at this again. I think you're completely right. First of all, why do we have? Yeah, yeah. Here you're saying the Schnett ninety six atom and the FHIMs ninety six atoms. Now, I would have to ask Marcel about this. Um, it might be that it's just initial variance, but it might also not be right. It doesn't really look like here. And there might, okay, I cannot answer the question right now, but I'm sure there's a reason for that. And I'll ask Marcel, and if you, um, if you want to drop me a mail and, and I'll get back to you. That, that's the best I can offer right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any more going here? Oh, okay, so um, oh yeah, go ahead. maybe um, one last one. And so we had this little bit of the experience that if you try to use these, um, or at least some generations of phosphates for global structure optimization, um, that they still um, miss quite a lot. So for example, some um, with defects, some minimum energy structures. Um, have you ever tried any global structure optimization for solids? Uh, for solids, yeah. um, no, 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 it's on my. I personally have not. Uh, it's on my list though now, <laughs> uh, because mainly as a test for some new potentials. Um, but as far as I know, I mean, I know there are publications which specifically look at the relaxation of structures. I'm not sure for molecules or uh, or materials. And there's um, and then there's dedicated work here to find the ground states quickly. For example, from Denmark, I think, um, Hammer, Björk Hammer, I think, has a recent PhD graduate whose thesis includes this, I think. Yeah, so uh, what I'm saying is basically, no, I personally haven't. Uh, it's on my list, though, because uh, it's a useful thing to be able to do. And uh, there is work, though, which uh, analyzes machine learning potentials for relaxation of structures and even dedicated tricks to, to make uh, faster. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much and thank you, Matthias, again for your great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.